We'll get started. This week's parasha, Parashat Chukat. Now, for those, it starts with Paraduma, which is the red heifer. Now, for those who remember, about three months ago, we gave a class about these details when we spoke about the, fesh, the four special parashiot. One of them was Parashat Para. We spoke about it a little bit in detail, and I just wanted to re-elaborate, just to go over for people who weren't there or people who don't remember, just a little bit of those, and then we'll continue from there. So we spoke about that there's three types of mitzvot, three types of commandments a, pers- a person has, positive commandments, let's say, right? One of them is a remembrance or a testimony. For example, God says on Shabbat, you have to rest. Why? Because I rested on the seventh day. You rest because I rested. Or Pes- Pesach, Passover, is a commemorance that we got out of Egypt. And so on and so forth. These are what we call commandments, mitzvot, of testimonies, of remembrances, of things that happen, we're remembering them. A second one is something called a mishpat. Mishpat, mishpatim, are civil laws. Things that are needed for the safety of mankind. For example, don't kill, don't steal, don't burn a red light. <laughs> no, that one's not. <laughs> right? But you see that there's something that's needed for the safety of, people, of, human, of humanity. Civil laws. And the third one is something called chok. Or chuka. Or chokim in plural. Which basically means a divine ordinance. To establish it to you in a way where we can maybe understand it a little bit more, Rabbeinu Bachya says that it's something, that it's a decree from heaven, that the logic transcends the human mind. The com- to comprehend it is more difficult than other things. Like for example, if I tell you right now, don't kill. Make sense? Anyone in this room can argue with me that the commandment not to kill another person unless whatever circumstances are requiring but not the kind of person everyone over here can agree is wrong. Everybody can over here, agree over here that not stealing from another person is that's, that's the right thing to do. Anyone can argue on that? Someone over here wants to argue with me that stealing is correct? Everyone wants to agree with these things. Something that's simple, something that's understood. When it comes to divine ordinance, for example, when the Torah tells you you have to take a red heifer, that Rashi writes from Poran the Midrash that it cannot have, or it's actually Mishnah. That it cannot have two hairs that are white or two hairs that are black and it can never have a burden on it and take it and sacrifice it. And then you have to make a purification water with it. Afterward, you sprinkle it on the person and they become pure. But if you're pure and you sprinkle it, you become impure. The whole thing is not understood. The whole thing is just. And it's something that we have to understand. These are types of mitzvot in the Torah which the concept behind them, or the reality behind them, we just don't understand them. We cannot comprehend them. And it's what we call the chok. And the most famous of them is Paraduma, the one I just detailed out, just a little bit of the details of it. That we should, we should know that the Midrash brings down, don't think in your mind, right now we mentioned this example of Paraduma, don't think in your mind that it doesn't have any logic. Right? You're saying, nah, this doesn't make any sense, no. It has logic. The reality is that we just can't comprehend the logic. We just don't understand it. It's beyond us. It's, a, it's above us. And it says many great people in the world were able to understand them. All of the ones that are listed, many great people in the world, great Torah scholars, were able to understand the logic behind them. Even if they were far-fetched, they were able to understand them. Even Paraduma, even the Red Heifer. How do I know? The Midrash relates that Moshe Rabbeinu, that Moshe, Got it from God, the logic of it, as a present. God told him, here for you, present. No one else in the world, in the history of the whole entire world, will understand the logic behind Paraduma, behind the red heifer, except for you. For me, to you, present. On the flip side of the coin, we see, Shlomo HaMelech, that the Midrash in Shira Sharim Rabbah says, it was the wisest person, the smartest person to ever live. Last time we gave a story about the thief, so on and so forth. I, don't, I won't extend too much on the story of Shlomo HaMelech, but the Midrash and Chazal teach us that Moshlomo Amenech was one of the smartest people to ever live. And about the Paraduma, what does he say? Vehi rechoka mimeni. And it eluded me. I tried my best to fathom all the Torah with all of its wisdom, to go with my wisdom and learn it and fathom it. And this one thing was, was beyond me. Now this is, the Gemani, this is what the Gemani Yosechet Yomah brings down. Also the Rokeach, one, one of the famous commentaries, he brings down, if you take the numerical value of hi rechoka, and Paraduma, they both equal to 341, signaling that's what he was talking about. 
So you see, one of the, the greatest mind in the whole entire world to ever live didn't understand this thing. However, Moshe Rabbeinu did. Moshe Rabbeinu had merited to know one more thing than Shlomo Amenech, who was the smartest person to ever live in the whole entire world. Now we spoke about this last time, about what's the reasoning. What was so special about Moshe? What did Moshe have that he was able to merit? What did he have that he was able to merit to have one more thing than Shlomo Amenech? If you look at the, look, if, I'm just talking to you and me and you right now. If we look at the qualifications on paper, who is more qualified? We just learned that our sages told us that Shlomo Amen is the strongest person to ever live. And on the other side of the coin, we have Moshe Rabbeinu, who, yes, he was very smart. Yes, he was, but it doesn't say that he was the smartest person to ever live. So who's more qualified? On face value, who's more qualified? Obviously Shlomo Amen. And who was the one who married it to know it? Moshe Rabbeinu. Why? So the Torah testifies in Moshe one thing. And it says Moshe was the most humble person in the world. Humble. Humility. And we spoke about last time that because of that humility, and what does it mean to be humil- humble? We'll talk about it in a moment. But because of that humility, because of that ability to understand that the wisdom of God is so far beyond us, because you understood, look, what does it mean to be humble? When I come and I tell you something humble, most people in the world, and we spoke about this in the past, you think of a humble person, a person who's shy, a person who's in the back, don't talk to me, you don't speak to anybody. But if you look at Moshe Rabbeinu, he wasn't that. Moshe Rabbeinu, we see that when Paro, the Midrash brings down, when Paro would go out at 4 o'clock in the morning to use the bathroom because he told everybody, I'm a God. He said, everybody, I'm a God, I don't use the bathroom. And all day he wouldn't go to the bathroom. He would wake up extra early to go use the bathroom. God told Moshe, where are you going to go meet him? When he's using the bathroom. Go to the Nile and meet him when he's using the bathroom. Why to show him? Everybody knows, your, I know your phony baloney. <laughs> and Moshe comes to this person as he's doing what he's doing. Again, this is a person who's a knife. You ever seen a humble person walk up to a person? Hello, what is or yelling. We see certain instances in Moshe Rabbeinu didn't act to what our classification of what a humble person is. And this is what I think a clear distinction between humility is. There's humility that leads to inaction, which is a bad type of humility, and there's humility that leads to action. What do I mean? A concept in humility is this. There's a Gemara Masechah Bachot that says, anyone who fixes his place for prayer, who sets a place for prayer, he only prays in this one place. He's a person that the God of Abraham, Elokei Abraham, will, be, will assist him. Bezo. He will come and help him. And when he passes away, when they eulogize him, when they come to give a eulogy now, when the person passes away, they're going to say, where is the humble one? Where is the pious one from the Talmidim of Abraham Avinu? From the students of Abraham Avinu? Where did he, he go? So we see that a person who fixes his place in shul, he said, this is my place, this is where I sit. He's considered to be a person who's humble. Now I ask you a question, if we're thinking about us today, that sounds like a person who's humble. Huh? He comes to shul, this is my place, I only sit over here. One day he comes a little bit late, someone's sitting in his place, <laughs> Habibi, come, come, the guy's in the middle of praying, he moves the guy away, this is a couple of humble, get out of here right now, get into the fight with the guy, this is my place, no, 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 get the fight with the guy. This is the guy who's humble. This is the guy you call him humble, you see him walk in. Oh, oh this man plays, get out of here, get out of here quickly. Now he's fighting with the guy. What do you mean? Already here, already praying, push it. <laughs> this is humble. So obviously, Chazal didn't mean that he fixes his place for prayer in the metaphorical sense of this is my only place. Obviously, the humble thing to do is if someone's sitting in your place, to sit somewhere else. But I heard one time a beautiful pirush. There was one uh, person who happened to be a Jewish person who was also a psychologist. He also was a very learned person. And he commented on this Gemara. And he says, I know, and I'll explain to you what it means. A person who sets for himself a place retroactively, internally, what is he doing? He's setting place for another person. He's setting place for others. This is my place, and I'm leaving place for you. And then you can understand that a person who's humble is a person who knows how much space to take in every situation. What do I mean? Not physical space. Not I'm 300 pounds and I take up 300 pounds. No. Mental space. There's certain people in the room when they walk into the room, you know they walk into the room. Yes? Molavi. <laughs> huh? There's certain people who walk into the room, you know that they walk into the room. As soon as they walk into the room, everyone already, guy walks in, he's with his chest up, puffing out like this. You know that he walks into the room. Why? Because he's taking up a lot of mental space. And there's certain people 
that will come to you or a class and an event and you won't even know they were there. You were there? Yeah, I was at your kupa, I was there, I was at the wedding, I saw it, you were singing, Modeh, Ani, what that? I heard the whole thing. Boy. I heard, yeah, that's how you came out, she came out. I didn't see you, I didn't even know you were in the kupa. Yeah, I was in the back, I was in. This is a person who takes up very little mental space. What's the key? What's a person who's humble? He knows exactly how much space to take in every situation. There's a Bishnah Pachya Avot that says, Bamakom She'en Ish, Tishtadel Yot Ish. Bamakom She'esh Ish, Al Ish. In a place where there's no other person, do your best to be that person. In a place where there is a person, don't be that person. What does that mean? Now, there's certain people who come to Shul, and you, you guys already know by now that when, uh, when 10 men pray together, there's one who goes up and prays on behalf of everybody, right? Shulchan Awuch, the book of law that we have, he writes down when they ask you to go up, the first time you have to say no. Come, come, please, please, no. Second time, no, but turn your legs toward them. The third time you have to get up and go, get up and go. Right? There are certain people, they don't even wait to be asked. They're already standing over here. Get up. Nobody asked you to come. Nobody wants you here. What you <laughs> Nobody wants you here. What are you doing? He doesn't care. The rabbi's giving a shiur. In the middle of the shiur, he screams out, wait, I heard like... Nobody has to, to be the person right now. But it's a concept of understanding when to be the person. What it basically means is to know when to step up to the plate. When you have to use the, build, the tools that you got. And what made Moshe Rabbeinu great, and Moshe had everything to be arrogant about. He had money, as the Midrash relates, that he got, became very wealthy after the tablets. He was handsome. He was uh, strong. Everything he could have. And he was humble. Why? Because he understood a concept and humility, which is everything comes from God. Someone comes to tell you now, oh, you're such a good basketball player. Oh, you're such a good speaker. Oh, you're like this. There's certain people, you tell them, yeah, you really play basketball well. He's like, yeah, me, I'm number one, <laughs> I'm the best, right? And there's another person who tells you, yeah, man, I, what does it do with me? Someone's come to me after right now and tell me more, you're a very good speaker. What am I, what's my answer gonna be to you? What does it have to do with me? What does it have to do with me? I'm not doing anything. Hashem came over here, put the words in my mouth, and that's why we're up here. But it's understanding, yes, God gave you tools. And there are certain things that you're going to be good at, and more so than other people. But understanding, they didn't come from me. Understanding that it came from God. And I think the reason why Moshe Rabbeinu merited to reach such a high level is because he understood this point. That Hashem's wisdom, his capabilities are far behind our comprehension. Shlomo Amalek, he tried his hardest to understand it, how and wisdom and mathematics. And Shlomo Amalek was well versed in astrology, mathematics, science, everything you possibly imagine. He put kings in his generation in his pocket. In astrology. They relate one time a story. Shlomo Amalek, when he wanted to build the Bet HaMikdash, the holy temple, he went to one of the kings in the, neighboring, in the neighboring kingdoms. And he told them, send me some workers. I need some workers to come and help me build the thing. So the guy didn't want to send them good workers. So what did he do? He told his astrologers. Look in the stars, tell me which people over here are dying within the next year, and we're going to send it to him. So they picked out, hand picked out all the people that they saw through the stars that are going to die within the year. They walk into Shlomo Amalek's palace, Shlomo Amalek looks at them, gave them sackcloths, like white, like white clothes for burial, sent them back to the king and, and t with a message. You don't have places to bury, you don't have the means to take care of the people who are going to die in your, in, your, in your country, it's okay, I'll help you out. You know, I got some people, but send me back people who are going to be living past the year. Without even, didn't even look into the stars. He just looked at them and he knew. Shalom Amalek's wisdom was in every possible way. And he used all of his wisdom to try and understand this, these things. And he didn't understand it. And he didn't come to him. And he didn't get anyone. And never married it to understand it. Why? Because he tried to understand it through himself. Through my wisdom. Through my intelligence. Moshe Rabbeinu understood one of the most important principles. My wisdom. My intelligence. My... You know why Moshe Rabbeinu was okay? You know why he married it? Because he didn't want to know. You know the Jewish people, what's the biggest shadow of the Jewish people, God? What makes it so great? That when God came to us, and by the way, the Midrash says that he went to every other nation. And he asked him, you want the Torah? You want it? You want it? You want it? Everyone said no. He came to us and we said, nah, save and Ishma. We'll do and we'll listen. You understand the ramifications of the words, we'll do and we'll listen? First we'll do, because we know whatever you're saying is true, and then we'll figure out why it's true. First we're going to do it, and then we'll figure out. Because if you're, if you're telling me it's true, God tells Moshe Rabbeinu, go to the people, we're going to do this para Duma, we're going to go do this red heifer. Moshe Rabbeinu doesn't even ask him, Ma, what's going on here? What's the reason? Why? Okay, you say, let's go. You don't want to know? You're not interested? 
You don't want to know the reasoning behind it? No, we said it, it's true. It's an eighth. And I think that's the mala. That's the gdula. That's the greatness. The greatest understanding that God's divinity, God's wisdoms, God's capabilities are so beyond, beyond the comprehension. So beyond what we can understand. And I think that's what the Midrash is telling us. The Midrash is telling us, you want to understand what is paraduma? Paraduma, the Torah calls it, Zvezot Chukat HaTorah, Asher Tziva Hashem. And this is the chok, the decree of the Torah. One of the famous commentaries, Or Haim, he comments and asks, wait a minute, I have a question. How come he uses these words? Zot Chukat HaTorah. This is the mandate, this is the decree of the Torah. It should have said, Zot Chukat, this is a decree. This is divine ordinance. Why we need the word Torah? Zot Chukat HaParah. Why they're saying this is the mandate of the Torah? Explains the Ochaim that any person who takes upon himself this one mitzvah, this one commandment of Paraduma, it's as if, as if he did the whole 613 mitzvot. It's as if it equates to. Why? We know the Bet Levi brings down in his Sefer Al-Bitachon, in the first chapter, he brings down a Gemam Sechet Makot, the Rabbi Yonah talks about over there a few different people. And he says that the whole Torah stands on one foundation. What is that? Emunah and Hashem. Faith in Hashem. Bitachon and God. That a person who believes in God, that's the foundation of the whole entire Torah. And therefore it explains, you know why the Paraduma, this red heifer, is the foundation of the whole entire Torah? Because you don't understand it. Because you don't understand it, and the fact that you don't understand it, that shows what the truth is. That shows where your heart is. Do you only do things when you understand it? Yeah, it makes sense to me. It works out in my mind. I got it. It makes logical sense to me. Or well, I do it because this is what God wanted me to do. And I was the Gdullah Moshe Rabbeinu. And he understood that. And listen to this. Moshe Rabbeinu understood that through this understanding that Hashem is greater than what we can possibly comprehend. He merited to reach higher levels that Shlomo Amena couldn't reach. And what's the, what's the lesson for us? What's the lesson for us? Who is more qualified? We said it a minute ago, Shlomo Amena. In your life, you're gonna have situations where there might be somebody more qualified for you. You put the application for the job, you send an application, you send something in, you apply for this, whatever it is, and you think in your head there's gonna be somebody more qualified for the job. If Hashem wants to give it to you, if your heart is with Hashem, I have faith in Hashem 100%, you're going to get the job over somebody else. You send down your resume for Shiduchi. To go on a Shiduch. There's going to be a person who's always going to be more uh, well suited for this person. Doesn't make a difference. If this person is meant to be yours, it's yours. And nobody in the world can take it. Nobody in the world can take it from you. If this person is meant to be yours, they're yours. But what is it, Taluyan? What is it contingent on? You understanding? That, what did Moshe Rabbein understand? Yeah, Shlomo Melech is the smartest person in the entire world. Great. He's more qualified to know. But I don't want to know. I trust God 100%. And because of that, Hashem gave it to him. Also us. When you send in an application, when you send a resume, don't ask, wait, maybe they're going to be better about this and about that. What about he's taller than me, but I'm only five days, and then he's only 6'3", and all these other calculations. I send the resume. If it's meant to be, Hashem wants it's going to be. One time, I said a story before, but I didn't say the finale. My mother owns a salon. So they opened up across the street from us. Another salon with a similar service. For example, we do nails. They said, we're going to open up and do nails also. So my mom came to me. She says, look, what are we going to do? People are opening up next across the street. I told her, no one in the world, the Yama says, that God decrees on a person how much money he's going to make for the year. No one in the world can take what's yours. I don't care if they open up next door to you. No one in the world can take what's yours. No one in the world can touch something that belongs to you. And you have to believe that wholeheartedly. I said this over maybe about six months ago, seven months ago in the Shiur. You know what the finale is? I'll tell you today, they closed down. They want to cross the street, they closed down. Why am I saying this? I have a prophecy. I was able to see the prophecy that they're going to close. No one in the world, it's a simple belief. No one in the world can take something that belongs to you. Period. If you know that it's yours. You know, they one time asked, we're going to bring up the Baba Sali in a little bit. They one time asked, I think it was the grandson of the son of the Baba Sali. There's something called in, uh, in Judaism, Kabbalah Ma'asit. 
that a person who knows the, the inner workings of the mysticism of Judaism, he knows how to manipulate nature in certain type of ways, and it's not allowed to do it. But we saw Baba Sali did great miracles. Great miracles. So they one time asked his grandson, I said, wait, is it, or your son, well, I, don't know, I don't remember who it was, and I asked him, is it, your, fa- your father did, Kabbalah Masid, he did this thing, it's not allowed, he said, Chas Shalom, God forbid, don't ever say that. So they asked him, how was your, you know what Baba Sali did? One time a guy came to him in a wheelchair, he told him, get up. And the guy got up and walked. One time a guy came to him, he didn't have gas in his car, he put him a bottle of alcohol in the car, told him to drive. Three months later, the guy came back, he says, yeah, Rabbi, I was driving the next day, and I went to fill up gas. Baba Sali told him, why you fill up gas? If you never would, if you never would have filled up gas, the car would have drove for the rest of its life. Based on what? I want to understand. Based on what? What? You can put Arak. I want everyone to go home right now. Don't do it. Please don't. Go put Arak in your car. Yeah? Go buy a bottle of Arak. And, and by the way, you should know Arak is good for everything. You have a stomach ache? Then Arak and mothers know. Put it in the stomach, rub it in the stomach. You have a toothache? Gargle with Arak. Arak is good for everything. Don't put it in your car. <laughs> don't put it in your car. Comes up and says, put it in the car. Put it in the car. The car's driving. He's driving back. Oh, Pelad. Five hours, two weeks, three weeks. And the thing is staying on E. <laughs> you know, some people, they get a little bit nervous. Maybe you get another 15 miles after it gets to the E. Maybe. Maybe. Another... The thing gets to E. The car's driving and driving. And when did he lose that? He would have kept on going forever. When he filled up gas. When you filled up gas, he would have kept on going forever. Why did Baba Sali have? What did he have that we don't have? He believed wholeheartedly. Why? Hashem can't do it. Hashem can't make you walk. Get up. Just get up. Just get up. Get up. Don't walk. What do you mean? It's so far-fetched. He believed wholeheartedly that Hashem is, has no mikbalot. There's no limitations. Nothing limiting him. Nothing stopping him. He can do whatever he wants. If you believe it. We spoke about it in the past. Who places the limitation on a person? It's not God. It's you. You place the limitation on yourself. You limit yourself. I can't do it. No, not me. I can't go, I won't be there. We are the ones who distinguish who, what's our capabilities. You'll be happy to find that if you do things, the same shaman, mirus the same shaman. If you do things because you said, okay, wait a minute. By the, you should know. If they, they call me to give a shiur right now, say, Mo, why don't you come give a shiur? Where's the shiur? Oh, it's over here. Does somebody else give a shiur there? Yes, I'm not coming. No, we want you. I'm not coming. Why? Because there's no reason for me to come. In a place there's no other person, I'll try my best to come. But if there's a person there, if there's somebody else there, I'm not coming. Why? Because there won't be matzliach. There won't be success in my hands. I don't care how good you speak. Hashem doesn't want you there, you're not going. So I did my calculation. I figured out this is what Hashem wants for me. I'm going. You will be surprised to find out that if you do this, you say, okay, wait a minute. Does God want me to do this now? you'll find that you have the capability within you to do things you never even thought you were able to. Couple comes to you, they need your help in a marriage. You're not a marriage counselor, you never went to school for counseling. Ever. But you say, okay, nobody else is going to help this guy. He's only confining in me, and he's not going to go to a marriage counselor, he's not going to go here, you're not going to go here. You open your mouth and you'll be surprised the words that come out. I guarantee you, you're going to say to yourself as you're talking, wow, I can't believe I said that. Oh, that's a good point. Oh, <laughs> where's all this coming from? You gotta do like this, you gotta do like this. Because we're the ones who place the capability in ourselves. But if we live our life in that way and we understood, you know, the Guru Ayyah brings down that Moshe Rabbeinu, when God told him to go and speak, he told him to go and speak to Paro. For a lengthy period of time, he told him, go and speak, go and speak, go and speak. Moshe said, no, 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 no. Until Hashem got fed up and says, I want will be your mouth. The Guru Ayyah brings down, if Moshe Rabbeinu would have just said yes, Hashem would have fixed his speech impediment. Moshe burnt his entire mouth and his tongue. If you would have just said, yes, Hashem, I'm going, I'll talk, everything would have been fixed. Even Moshe Rabbeinu, the greatest prophet to ever live in the whole entire world, we're talking about him right now, that he had the highest level of Mohammed, the and Hashem. You see that he placed limitations on himself. And he spoke to Hashem face to face. And it wasn't me who said this, it's the Guru Yerit. And therefore we learn for ourselves. That we are the ones who place the limitations on ourselves. And if we understood wholeheartedly that God's abilities are infinite and He can do whatever He wants, and that there is, there is no limitations, then we can tap into this and be like Moshe Rabbeinu. Shlomo Amelech, who was going with the limited mind of a human being, try to figure it out. And Moshe Rabbeinu said, I'm going with Hashem, he got it. Also with us. It doesn't matter who's more qualified. It doesn't matter who could do the job better. If right now you need it, and you don't ask questions and you go, watch. My guarantee. Watch how you get the capabilities in that you have. Hmm?
They need you to dunk in the finals, the chis, so you're gonna jump. Your vertical is gonna, you know, <laughs> no matter what it is. And this is what the Bible study understood. And it's something that's it's, it's almost a pellet. I understand for us, it's like ridiculous. But if we put ourselves over there and listen to this story, and I think this is this is such an important point because many times in our life we have to understand why is the paraduma chukat the Torah? Why is it one of the mandates, one of the decrees of the Torah? Because it's every day in our life we'll be faced in situations where we don't understand why God is doing one thing to us. And we can try to look at it and say, try to figure it out, try to figure it out, or we can say, Hashem, we're going with you. A person says, Hashem, we're going with you, whatever it is, whatever it's going to be for me, it's going to be for the best. There's a story that Rabbi Achil uh, Sparrow brings down. He's a famous Darshan. He has many Sfarim, many uh, books where he brings down stories. He brings down a story that happened in the early years of Emach Shemo of Hitler. Emach Shemo of Zechor. When he was just getting to, into, the, into the speeches and everything, and he would do speeches in dark cellars and basements for like 75, 80 people every week. And people don't know he was a very powerful speaker. If you see him speaking in Russian, I mean in Russian, <laughs> you see him speak in German, and then you see the translations, they don't match. All right? He's, he's screaming crazy over there, and the bottom is, yeah, I went to the store, bought flowers. <laughs> but he's a very powerful speaker. 75 people in the room. And he comes over there and he tells them, we have a choice to make. Everybody in this room, we have a choice to make. It's either the German people or the Jews. Together we cannot survive. If they survive, we die. If we, for us to survive, they must die. And I don't know about you, I choose Germany. And everybody in the room got up and they're screaming and they're cheering and he gave a whole powerful speech and everybody clears the room. And Hitler's standing over there on the stage in Machshemo. And he, hit, and he sees a guy in the back, after everybody cleared out, one guy, elderly guy, sitting all the way in the back, as he, soon as he finishes to speak, he hears like a clap. A slow, mocking clap. Now you can imagine Hitler, he got very upset. So he kind of squints and looks in the back and says, who is that over there? And he walks over to the guy and he tells him, who are you? The guy gets up, he looks at him and says, I'm a Jew. Hitler, of course, gets very upset, but the elderly man didn't, didn't even flinch. And, he had, and the Jew had a smirk on his face, a smile. So Hitler tells him, what are you smiling about? You don't believe that I'm going to do what I said I'm going to do? You don't believe I'm going to wipe you out from the world, all of you? The guy tells him, I, I believe you're going to try as, much, as hard as you can. I believe you're going to do everything in your power to do that. He says, so why are you smiling? He goes, I'll tell you why I'm smiling. Let me tell you. I don't know if you heard of, but there was many, many years ago, thousands of years ago, there was a man named Pharaoh. He also decided that he was going to come up with a formula how to deal with the Jews. And 210 years we were enslaved by him until God destroyed him with a mighty hand. And we got the holiday of Passover. He says, well, your great-grandfather many, many years ago, Haman, also in the times of uh, in the Persian Empire, Haman, he also wanted to have similar faith with the Jews. And God also destroyed him with a mighty hand in a similar fashion. And what did we get? Purim. Not the holiday. He tells them, and then the Greeks, they also wanted to assimilate the Jews and get rid of the Jews. And they also were wiped out. And we got Hanukkah. He looks at him, and he tells him, I'm smiling, because I know that you're going to do everything in your power to do that. He says, but I know that the same fate that they shared, that God came down on them, is going to come down on you. And I'm smiling because I'm thinking of the holiday that we're going to make when, you go, when you go down to the ground. And he looks at Hitler and he tells him, because you may have chosen Germany, but God chose us. And no matter what you're going to do, you're not going to wipe us out. You can't get rid of us. I don't care how much you're going to try. This is a person who's faced with an impossible situation. And he says, look, I, stand, I don't understand, but 100% Hashem is going to be with me here. 100% Hashem is going to be with me over here. And you know why I'm smiling? Because I know that at the end of this, the end of this, we're going to be smiling on your grave. Dancing, doing Yechudim and dances over there on your grave. The same way we did with Paro, the same way we're gonna do, we did with Haman, the same way we did with the uh, Ivani. We're gonna celebrate also because we're gonna get out of this, even though I don't see it today. And that's the ma, the ma'ala. That's what we want to get to. That's what we want to reach in our life to understand that the Kodesh is with us at every place we go. Listen to this. We see, hardly again, one of the famous, renowned speakers from the previous generation. He was one of the, one of the leading Kiru rabbis, outreach rabbis of his generation. He brought so many people back to religion. He said in his earlier years, 
He went, once went to an, a very intelligent wise man who was well versed in mathematics, science, psychology, philosophy. And he asked him a very intellectual question. At that moment, as the Rav Yagen was talking to this man, a little fly came by. The man smiled and he looked at the Rav Yagen with a smirk on his face. And he tells him, let me ask you a question. Do you think this fly understands us? Comprehends what we're saying, what's going on over here? Do you think he speaks Hebrew? Because they were speaking Hebrew. Do you think he speaks Hebrew? Obviously not. He tells him, so that means, if this tiny, smaller creation cannot comprehend us, which is a little bit of a bigger, more complex creation, how much more so? Us, just a mere creation, how are we supposed to understand our Father? How are we supposed to understand our Creator? You come, sometimes you ask questions. How do you expect to understand something that's so much greater than you? Like a fly trying to understand a human being. The one thing you have to understand that Moshe Rabbeinu understood is that his wisdom is divine. His capabilities are divine. And they are beyond you. So when you're in that moment, you're in that moment, don't think to yourself now and question it. Understand. Zot Kukata Torah. This is the decree of Torah. Right now, in this moment, right now, in this moment, is the decree of the Torah. When I'm facing a situation where I don't understand what's going on right now, I don't understand, even then I have a Mona Hashem. Hashem, whatever is going to be here is going to be for my best. When you do that, that's the foundation of the whole entire Torah. The Or Chaim says, if you did that, it's as if you did the whole entire Torah, you can die, you can die at that moment, you go up to heaven as if you completed the whole entire Torah. Why? Because it's as if it's as if you made a testament, as if you made a vow. Hashem, I believe in you 100%. That means, if I believe in you 100%, that everything is coming with it as well. Also this, and that means what? And how do you get there? How do you get to these places where you get the most amount of clarity? The most amount of light, the most amount of everything in the whole entire world, you get there by understanding. And where do we see this? What's the perfect example of this? Ravi again continues and he says, I want to go down a little bit of a journey with you guys. He tells us, he says, I don't understand Avram Avinu. If I was Avram Avinu, I don't know that I could stand. I'll give you a parable. Imagine now a woman goes to the Baba Sali. And everyone we heard about the crazy things Baba Sali used to do. She goes to Baba Sali, Baba Sali tells her, in nine months you can have a baby boy. Passes nine months, no baby boy. Okay, maybe it was a fluke, maybe the, the dates were off. One year, two years, nine years, no baby boy. Nine years, no baby boy. She tells me she's not going to have one negative thought in her heart. Ah, it's not really the Baba Sali. Ah, it doesn't really have power. She's not going to have one hiru, one petach, one opening his heart of bad thought of negativity. For sure she will. Avram Avinu, Hashem tells him, Lech lecha me'artzecha u'monotecha. Go from your land, your father's home, and go to a place I'll show you, and over there I'll make you into a gigantic, beautiful nation, and I'll bless you and your children and your offspring and all the blessings of the whole entire world. Who wouldn't go here? Yeah? Anyone in this room, God came down to you right now and told you, get up and leave, and I'm going to take you over there, I'm going to make you a great nation, I'm going to give you this, I'm going to give you wealth. Like everyone. Who's not getting up and going? Avram gets up, he goes, he gets there, what do they say? As soon as he gets to the land that Hashem showed him, what do they say? And there was a famine in the land. As soon as he gets there. Now what type of famine? You're going to tell me, okay, famine, it's normal. The Rambam writes, it was the worst famine in the history of the world. The most severe famine in the history of the world. And Moshe Rabbein, and Avraham Avinu continues. He says, okay, so can I do? keep on going. Not one negative thought in his heart. Not one negative thought in his heart. Avraham Avinu is a pasuk in the Shayahu that Hashem calls him Ahuvi, my beloved. What made Avraham Avinu so great? Ish Chesed, he was a guy who did kindness. Yes. He was the first person to see God, yes. But it's something more than that. You know what made Avraham Avinu so great? That he never even allowed one negative thought to even enter into his heart. The Tiferet Zion brings down that a, a negative word against Hashem never left his mouth. Ten nisyonot, ten tries that Gosh Baruch gave him. And the last one was the Akedah. He told him, take your son, which son? The son you love, Yitzchak. Go and slaughter him on the altar. This is the last test. Good. He comes back after doing the greatest sacrifice in the history of the whole entire world. What happens? He finds his wife is dead. Who over here had the capability not to have a negative thought in their heart? Who over here would not have a capability not to even get one negative thought into their mind? One negative thought you would not get into your mind? Not one? 
Avram Avinu, his greatness, you know what Hashem loves him? You want to know Hashem called him my beloved? You want to know the greatness of Avram Avinu? That no matter what he went through in life, he never one time had a negative thought of this I got chills. I'm telling you, he never once in his life had a negative thought of this. You understand what I'm telling you? Never once in his life. And I, Abu Hashem, no one over here what had go to what Abraham Avinu went to. Never once. And it's a pasuk. I'll tell you right now the pasuk. It says, La petach chatat robet. To translate loosely to English, it means, sin is waiting at the door. What does it mean? The Yetzirah is waiting at the door. The Gemara Masechet Kiddushin says, Hashem says, I created the Yetzirah, and I created the antidote for the Yetzirah, which is the Torah. A person who goes on the way to the Torah, he's saved from him. A person who steps away from it, he falls into his grasp. The Gemara Masechet Bachot says that the Yetzirah is Domel Zvuv. He's like a, a fly that sits at the Petach, the Shtep Tachim of the Lev. The two openings of the heart. What does it mean? The Yetzirah is mamash, literally, waiting at the opening of your heart, waiting for you to have one negative thought so he can jump in there and make the whole situation bad. For you to have one negative thought, one off, miscalculated moment, one situation of, and he's just waiting. You know that in the beginning of this week's parasha, Rashi writes, he brings down from Shem, Rav Moshe Adarshan, that the para Duma, the red heifer, comes to atone for, her, for, for the calf. What's the calf? The golden calf. The mother comes to atone for the child. What, what's the connection between the red heifer and the golden calf, the sin of the golden... If we go back to the sin of the golden calf, we see what caused him to fall. Moshe Rabbeinu told him, I'm going to come back in 40 days. They miscalculated, he didn't come back. In their hearts, they had one second of doubt, one second of negativity in their hearts. The Gemara Masechet Shabbat says, Hashem, right away, Yetzirah came, showed them an image of Moshe Rabbeinu on his deathbed, and they all fell. I'll take it a step further. There's Gemara Masechet Nadarim, they said, Abraham Avinu. They asked the question, how come the Jewish nation had to go down to Egypt for 210 years? A machroket in the Gemara, which action Abraham Avinu did, whether it was that he took the, all the Talmudim, all the students out to war to go say, Lord. Whether it was that when Hashem promised him the land, he said, give me a sign. Or whether it was that when he had an opportunity to help other people to get closer to them, he didn't do it. For that one miscalculation, for that one miscalculation, which any one of us could have made a similar mistake, and every one of them was justified, 210 years we suffered. Why? Chatat, Petach, but Petach Chatat Rubet. At the opening, this Yetzirah is waiting for you to have a negative thought in your heart so he can jump into you. He can mess up everything. He's waiting. My love, a great person, the, the, the attribute of a great person, a person who says, I'll never even allow a negative thought to come to my heart. And Koshikin, how much more so? The mouth. To say negative things. Oh, where's Hashem? Where's this? And where's that? There's a story that happened in the height of World War II. There was a family, the Guns family. They were in the Warsaw ghettos. They were in uh, that moment, they were in one of the places where they were staying in a one bedroom apartment with other family, crammed in there with nothing to eat. You understand what nothing to eat means? Not like us when we come to the house, open the refrigerator, we have all the food over there. We have nothing to eat over here and the food is free. It's full with food over there. And not even the three year old mustard you have in the refrigerator that nobody touched in three years. Not even that they had in the refrigerator. Zero calories. Not even the mustard they had in the refrigerator. The only way that they could survive was if they had one person be willing to run out. At that point, they had curfews. Any person that they found outside after 8.30, zagdi mavit. Right away, trrr, there. Kill him. And the, the young son over there, Chaim Gans. He decided, I'm going to go every single night, sneak through the alleyways, to ruffle through garbage to see if I can find some leftovers that are edible to bring home. Every night he would go, and you can imagine like a hawk with his eyes open and his ears, he would walk and walk and walk and walk, trying to knock, because Nazis were swarming the streets looking for people. And walk and walk and walk. And one day he's walking, and he's, of course, he's listening attentively, and he hears a noise around him, he turns around, it's already too late. There was a Nazi behind him, he followed him all the way from the ghetto. A gun pointing to him, does a move, pushes him with a gun. He directs the boy all the way to the city square where he sees five other Jewish boys standing up against the wall. He tells Chaim, go stand next to them. His friend comes out, pulls out a gun, 
puts it in the, all of them, he's about to... At that point, Chaim understood his fate was coming, he did vidui. He said, Hashem, chatati, aviti, bishat, Hashem, forgive me for anything I may have did or against you. And took upon himself the mut, he to Hashem, took upon himself to die in the sanctity of God's name. He gets up against the wall. The Nazi, in that moment, the Mark Shemo, he tells them, where is your God now? Where is your God now? What can he do to stop me? He can't stop me. Chaim couldn't take it anymore. At this point, the anger was already, Adlepo, kill me is okay. But talk about my God, Adlepo, I'm telling you. He turns around and says, let me tell you one thing. And one thing only, shoot me mouth if you have to, I don't care. Understand one thing. My God could do whatever he wants. My God could do whatever he wants. And if, him, if in Shamayim right now, that it came down, that we have to be put to death, so we'll die. So be it. But if not, if God decreed that we're not going to die, no matter what you're going to do, you cannot kill us. Shoot the gun a little black. No matter what you're going to do, you cannot kill me today. If it didn't come out from Shamayim. I believe that wholeheartedly with all my entire heart. At that moment, they hear, getting louder, louder, louder. They look up. Allied dive bombers coming their way. The two Nazis look and run. The six boys look up and they run and every single one of them was saved. Every single one of them was saved. No matter what situation you are in your life, no matter what you're facing, no matter what you're going through, Emunab Shita Hashem could do whatever He wants. There's nothing Hashem cannot do. There's nothing Hashem cannot do. If we understand that, if we get there, if we understand, we get to that place where we understand that nothing Hashem cannot do. The things that are, the Bet Levi brings down, he brings a Pasuk in Mishle, and he says a person, Abotech by Hashem, is is Gav. He's Gav. He says that if a person is Botech by Hashem, he's fortified. What does it mean? That even if God forbid, the gun is already at your hand. If you believe in Hashem, no harm can come your way. And he says the opposite also true. Even if the gun doesn't exist, but you believe it does, then the gun will exist. Your thoughts, the way you think, the way you believe things, the way you see things. If you believe, you can even change something. If you believe, you can even change something that was already... If you believe, you can change something that already was decreed upon you. That already was decreed upon you. You can change it. Just by believing it. Even if it's there. There was another story of a mother who also lived in the cities of Europe. Her son one day fell deathly ill. He was not feeling good. She took him to the doctor. The doctor happened to be it was Friday morning. They waited, they waited. The doctor saw the boy. He tells the mother, I don't know how to tell you this. The boy has a 10% chance of survival. The only thing I can do to maybe save him is give him this medicine. He writes her a prescription on a piece of paper. He tells her, go to the pharmacy and get this, give it to him, and blot the shem, he has a short of vote, and God willing, there'll be good news. And he sends the woman off. The woman goes. When it's Shabbat, the doctor couldn't take it in his heart. He, didn't, he was worried about the boy. He wanted to know what happened to the boy. So he went and he knocked on the door of the woman. He comes, he opens the door, he sees the woman standing over there. You would think maybe she's crying. Eh? He says, what happened? She goes, I'll tell you. I, as soon as I left over here, it was a few hours before Shabbat, I went running around to every pharmacy. Every single one of them was closed. Before I knew it, it was time for Shabbat to come in. I'm sitting in the house with my son who was sick. No medicine. And this piece of paper of description that you have in front of me. And I'm, what am I going to do? Shabbat's about to come in. I said, okay, what can I do? I went to the Shabbat lights. I said, I'm going to light the candles. When she lit the candles, she says, at that moment, I started to cry tears. And I said, Hashem, you're the doctor. A you're the one who heals. You're the one who heals. Not the medicine, not the doctors. You're the one who heals. Heal my son. And as she's saying this, the guy sees the boy running in the back playing. He goes, so what happened? She goes, I took the paper you gave me. I ripped it up. I put it in the water. I let him drink the water. And the next morning, he got a feeling 100% fine. A prescription. Not the drug, the paper. Cut it up, put it in the water, told him, drink this water. He drank the water, he got up the next morning fine. The next morning, he got up fine. When a person believes that Hashem could do anything for him, the reality doesn't have to make sense. Such doesn't have to make sense. Moshe Rabbeinu understood that. Moshe Rabbeinu understood that. And now we have to understand that this builds on to the next point, which is why do we do what we do? 
When I come to a person and I ask him, why do you respect your parents? What do you mean? Akarata tov, appreciation, they raised me all entire life. Rav again says no. He says, that's not, that shouldn't be your answer. You know why I respect my parents? Because the Torah was in the Torah says I have to respect my parents, that's why I do it. You're right, other factors. I do it because Hashem said so. I can figure it out, appreciation. Hashem said so, and therefore I do it. Hashem said so, and therefore I do it. When you reach this level to understand that the, the, the divinity of God is far beyond the comprehension, that's when you become elevated. That's when you reach heights that no one else in the world can reach, even if their quality, qualities are above yours. Shlomo Amalek didn't get it, but Moshe Rabbeinu did. And I'll finish with this. The Gemara Baba Metziah says, Ha'olam hazeh domei lelayla. This world is likened to nighttime. Why nighttime? Nighttime is dark. You can't see anything. You don't know where you're going, and it's misleading. Sometimes you walk in an alleyway, you see a shadow, you think it's a robber, it's a shrub, and sometimes you see a shadow, you think it's a shrub, it's a robber. You don't know. It's misleading. However, there is one way, there is one thing, this whole entire world is darkness. Shema'ir ta'olam, the lights of the world, is the pasuk in Mishle that says, Ki ner mitzvah, utorao. Utorao. A mitzvah is a ner, is a, is a candle, and a Torah is light. That in light, we're all going to be going through situations in life where we may be faced with darkness. You want to know the way out of the darkness? The Torah. When you cling on to it, when you say, Hashem, I'm with you 100%, that'll take you out of the darkness. That'll save you. That'll bring you up. That's the Moshe Rabbeinu was to. That's what made him get up to the highest levels. That's what made him reach the highest levels that even Moshe Mohammed, who was the wisest person, the Midrash says, the wisest person to ever live, he couldn't reach. Because Moshe Rabbeinu understood one principle, he knows more than me. And therefore, you know what I think? And I'm going to say this for myself. I didn't see this inside. I think the answer to what the logic behind Parah Duma was, that there is no logic. Shlomo Amalek couldn't understand it because he's looking for the logic. Moshe Rabbeinu understood that there is no logic and that's the answer. Torah Duma doesn't have to have logic. It has logic. It doesn't have to have logic for us to understand. And that's the answer. The answer is, is we have to go through our life without not necessarily have to, not everything we have to understand. Hashem, Tiva, Hashem. Hashem decreed, that's it. Over. Done. That's it. What I have to understand? Me, my logic, who cares? Doesn't matter. They have it. He writes that there's two people who died for this Two people who died for the sanctity of God's name. He says, one who lived his whole entire life, he only did what was Mr. Berlo. Yeah, it makes sense. This, this, that. Another one who says, I'm going with Hashem Ba'esh Ba'ayim. Whatever Hashem says, I'm going. He says, the one who lived his life with 100% faith and belief in God, the sanctity that he had in that moment, Chas V'Shalom, never happened to anyone else, is at a much higher level than Allah. That's our Avoda. That's our work in this world. Is to understand that no matter how dark moments can get, no matter how far we find ourselves, no matter where things seem, no matter how far the logic is, when we understand that Hashem's divinity, His wisdom is far beyond our comprehension, then we understand that everything is good. Then we smile. Then we're happy. And guess what? When you have that attitude, that's what the Betelevi says. When you have that attitude, you believe that everything will be good, it will be good. Even if it's supposed to be bad. 